It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of April 14th, 1995. Only three movies to look at today, so let's just jump on into it, and we'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend, and I say that in quotation marks because this was not a big hit whatsoever, but of the new releases, it was the top grossing for one of the three, and that is Polly Shore in Jury Duty. Since the days of our founding fathers, justice has always been blind. Now, fear not, citizen. She's dumb. Justice will be served. You're in good hands. Ow, ow. Because Pauly Shore has just been served. A jury duty notice? Look, it's the juice. Run, OJ. Run. Now, a nation waits for answers. They picked a jury. They picked a jury. They're serving tuna salad for lunch. Tuna salad for lunch. A jury sacrifices all personal comforts. Welcome to your new home, away from home. Lifestyles of the rich and sequestered. And the murder suspect puts his life in the hands of the people. So what do you think? About what, you're sleeping or you're drooling? Up against impossible odds. You are the sexiest creature I've ever seen. Let's sauna. One man stands alone. And that is why you elected me, jury foreman. To protect our honor. Counsel will approach the bench. What are you doing here? I didn't think it was fair that you guys got to have your own little secret powwow over here while we didn't get to listen. It's not fair. To defend our freedom. Number six, sit down! And most of all... the system for everything it's worth. That's the peanut call. Pauly Shore is out for justice. <laughs> Jury duty. Your girlfriend's here to kiss you goodbye. Say hi to Judgeito. <laughs> I mean, really, do I need to say anything more about this movie? I mean, just from that trailer alone, you can see everything that's wrong with this movie. This is not a funny movie. This is a film that has been universally panned both by critics and audiences. It was a notorious box office bomb. And you can see why on screen, because it's a one-joke premise and not even a good one-joke premise. You basically... It's basically Pauly Shore, he gets to be a juror, and he's doing whatever it takes to keep the free accommodations, keep this, keep this case going. And and first of all, nobody is ever that excited for jury duty. I don't care who you are. Like, nobody, nobody is that excited for jury duty. And I'm sorry, is, and everybody knows that, but not the idiots who made this movie and the... Yeah, I really don't have anything more to say about this one, because really, what more can I say about this movie? This is the lowest of the low for Paul, is for comedy. I mean, it's Pauly Shore just hamming it up for the camera for an hour and a half. And, I mean, he makes movies like Billy Madison and Tommy Boy look like classics by comparison. Look like Citizen Kane by comparison. I'll never forget when Cisco and Ebert reviewed this movie... They didn't like Tommy Boy, they didn't like Billy Madison, but even Gene Siskel said, I would rather watch it from dusk to dawn, Chris Farley Film Festival, than watch this movie again. I mean, that's probably the best way to describe this movie. It's just it's just a mess of a film. It's a one-joke premise. It doesn't have a charismatic actor leading the charge. It's Pauly Shore. The, people who are, the rest of the people in this movie should be ashamed of themselves for saying yes to this. I mean... Uh, Tia Carrera from Wayne's World, Stanley Tucci's in this movie, Brian Doyle Murray, Shelley Winters, Ava Goda, like... They deserve much better than this. Like, this is the bottom of the barrel for comedy in general. This is just not a good movie at all. And, like I said, I don't really think I need to delve more into this because the evidence there speaks for itself. Like, you really just need to watch that trailer to see that, hey, this is a terrible movie. I shouldn't see it. And it's my dumbass as a kid saw the movie, and I still, feel, I still regret it ever since. So, um... So that's a nice way to start this week off with a terrible movie like that. Let's turn it around a little bit. Let's get to a couple of movies that were seen as notor as box office failures, but they are actually a lot better than I think would people would give them credit for. And we'll start off with 
the Don Bluth directed film The Pebble and the Penguin. Deep in a frozen country, at the far end of the earth, there's an ancient ceremony where a penguin must find the perfect pebble to give to his future bride. And boy, did you find a pebble. Bring up! Is that an engagement pebble or what? Hubie! I love it. But Hubie's rival Drake has other plans. Nobody's going to marry a loser like you. Now give me that pebble. No, no, it's, it's from Marina. Hubie! <laughs> <laughs> now, fate has taken him to the other side of the world. I got just 10 days to get back home before the full moon ceremony. But with the help of a new friend. Who's her busting out here? Take me with you. Yes. Oh. They'll travel night and day. Yeah, I give it two days, Tops, and you'll be in the belly of anything from a killer whale to a sardine. I'm a good swimmer. You've got eat me written all over you. To try to get back to his true love. I'm destined to marry Marina. I'm destined to marry Marina. Dab, 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 dab. And they'll form a friendship. I think you're... Fabulous. You have to gush like that? That will last forever. Look how we get along together. You are incredibly annoying. I think it's MGM Pictures invite you yes. to feel the magic. This is it. Everybody knows penguins can't fly. This is a chance of a lifetime. Ah. The fly of a lifetime. Share the adventure. And come along on an incredible journey. Here we go! The Pebble and the Penguin. You're the greatest romantic hero of all time. You're the stupidest penguin who ever lived. With the voices of Martin Short. Goodness, glaciers. Jim Belushi. I'm flying. Tim Curry. Wake up and smell the sea. And the music of Barry Manilow. The Pebble and the Penguin. So let me just say right off the bat, this is not one of Don Blue's strongest movies by any means necessary, but compared to what he's done in the in the, in the early 90s, Rockadoodle, ambitious film, but mostly a failed attempt to try to mix live action and animation, trying to be another Who Framed Roger Rabbit, but... Uh, Failing miserably, uh, Thumbelina was just a straight up Disney ripoff, right down to having the characters, from, voice notable voice actors from Disney, involved in it. And the less I say about Troll in such a park, the better, because we that is the lowest of the low for him. But with this movie, at least, it's a noticeable improvement by the ter in terms of the way the story is told. It's more simplified. It's not all over the place. It's not a great story overall, but. It makes it at least makes much more sense than the early '90s movies that we've seen from Don Bluth. I mean, um, you got a pretty good voice cast here. Martin Short is easy to buy as Hubie. Uh, Annie Golden, uh, he's she was a uh, Cliff's girlfriend on Cheers. She's she's pretty good as Marina. Uh, Jim Belushi's easy to buy as Rocco. Uh, Tim Curry is the bad guy. I mean, where can you go wrong there? They use the voice cast here much better than Bluth's other two movies that he did. But, and uh, the music overall, I think, is a lot better. This is Barry Manilow again writing the music, but unlike Thumbelita, where it seemed like he was kind of sleepwalking through that movie, you could definitely tell that he that the songs in this movie were more had he had more of an intention of making better songs out of them. Like the opening number, for example, the the song "Now and Forever." It's an extravagant and impressive musical number with some great animation to go along with it. The idea of the the songbook coming to life as these as you see the characters from the movie like it's pretty well done a lot of the other songs in the movie are pretty solid too there are songs in here that are kind of forced and bland but but um and uh, but for the most part I thought there was much more there is much more improvement and much more going into this particular film than I thought Bluth had in the other two movies probably one of the biggest problems with the movie is that the character seems to be too smart for their own good like Marina cl clearly has it for Hubie in the beginning of the movie, but he's too shy to even admit it or talk to her until he gets that pebble. And of course, when Drake tries to continuously forces her to marry him, the guy can't take a hint that she doesn't love him. But the literal line from the movie from the bad guy is, she she keeps telling him no, and he keeps going, "Oh, I get it. You're joking." And it's like, there's nothing groundbreaking about these characters whatsoever. They're cliched characters, but I, like I said, 
I've seen a whole lot worse. But to the end of the movie's credit, like I said, the animation is very good. You know, certainly a lot better than some of the direct-to-video animated films that MGM was doing before after this. Like, wait until we get to All Dogs Go to Heaven 2. I mean, that movie looks like an ab looks abysmal for a theatrical release. But when we get to 1996, we will definitely delve into that one. But, like I said, overall, Pebble and the Penguin, it doesn't live up to that same caliber of the great booth movies of the past. Like, it's no Secret of Nim, it's no Land Before Time, it's no An American Tale, or even An All Dogs Go to Heaven, but... It's still better than what he was doing for much of this decade in the 90s. I mean, the animation is much better. They're cl the characters are cliche, but they're still rather likable. It's a simplified story, that, which is okay in this case. The music is nicely done. It is a mostly harmless and enjoyable film. If you like movies like Happy Feet or March of the Penguins, which I do... Like I like those type. I like that, that I like that trend that we had in the mid-2000s where they had all these different Penguin movies coming out. Most of them ended up being pretty good, but... Yeah, I think if you like those type of movies, you can definitely get invested in this. There's a lot here to enjoy about it here. It's not going to be any animated classic or anything like that, but I think it's a much better movie than people give it credit for. I would highly recommend checking it out if you want to see a good Don Bluth movie from the early 90s or that that lull he was in between All Dogs Go to Heaven and Anastasia. This is easily the best film of that bunch, so... Uh, that's Pebble and the Penguin. Let's move on to the last movie that we have here, and that is Al Franken starring in Stewart Saves His Family. I'm going to do a terrific show today because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Hello, I'm Stuart Smalley. Ever since I was a kid, go, go, go! I knew there was something wrong with my family. <laughs> my father grew up in the Great Depression. His mother, so he wasn't very supportive. Is Sir Eagle getting a little nervous? And my mother was much better at cooking than nurturing. What was your name again? Waste of Space. <laughs> Which is probably why I became kind of a guru of the self-help movement. Darn you, Mom! Darn you, Mom! I suppose I'm such a success because my childhood was such a challenge. I remember you when you were this high and this wide. As for my family... <sighs> We all want to go home and save our families, but we can't. Yeah. Well, they haven't changed much. That shot him, man. He shot him. Hey, Jody, look, I would never ordinarily say this, but um, <clears throat> is there any way you can get to a pound cake? Stewart saves his family. All right! Yeah! Oh! 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 You laugh because it's not your family. It's everyone crazy. You'll cry. Because it is. Well, that's the Smalley family. Uh, we're, you know, dysfunctional. But who? Who isn't? So this is, of course, the feature film debut for the SNL character Stuart Smalley. He'd been on SNL a number of times in the in the 90s and I think part of the 80s, the late 80s as well, because Al Franken had been there for so long at SNL. And um, um, it's kind of, this movie had sort of a similar release pattern to It's Pat the Movie the year before, which the studio basically dumped it. There was not a whole lot of promotion for it. It but it didn't open in a number of theaters. It came and went. It only made like a million dollars at the box office, but cost six million dollars to make. So it was the, a notorious failure. And it's a shame because unlike It's Pat the Movie, this is actually a really good little gem. Like. It's a smart, very funny, nicely made movie, and it works mostly because of Al Franken. He does a great job of bringing this character to the big screen without making the character completely annoying as hell like It's Pat managed to do. Like, the stick with It's Pat got old really quickly, but Franken keeps the character in his own environment. He doesn't make him an annoyance. He makes him very relatable to the situations going on, and it works mostly because it's a, it's sort of semi-autobiographical because Franken himself went through a 12-step program like Stuart Smalley does here. And you've got a great cast overall filling the parts that they have very well. Like, Franken is great. you got Shirley Knight, Leslie Boone, Vincent D'Onofrio, uh, Laura San Giacomo, Harris Eulin, Julia Sweeney, Joe Flaherty, Robin Duke, Richard Riel, Kurt Fuller. Just a phenomenal cast here, and they work really well here. And it's one of the few SNL movies I think gets unfairly judged. Would I go as far as to say it's one of the best films, like up there with Blues Brothers or Wayne's World? 
No, but it's definitely, in terms of the middle-range SNL movies, probably the best of the bunch. It's very clear that v Clever and how Franken is able to keep this character in his old wor world by creating this nice little universe for him to live in. Harold Ramis does a very good job directing this movie, and the pre film pretty much has a good message about families and doesn't sugarcoat the ending at all. It's one that, it reminded me a lot of a mix between A Christmas Story, like the way the narrative... Uh, the narration by Gene Shepard plays out, and a mix of another movie in 95 that was also very underrated, Home for the Holidays. It's like a kind of a meshing between those films. And it's a really good film. I think this is one that definitely people should give another look at because it's really one of the more underrated comedies from not just Harold Ramis, but from these SNL movies because it's really funny, it's really smart, it's a nicely made film. You might be surprised on how good this actually is. I would highly recommend checking out Stuart Says His Family. I think you will not be disappointed by it at all. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Next time, a huge slate of movies to look at, eight of them in particular, including Sandra Bullock starring in the romantic comedy While You Were Sleeping with Bill Pullman, also David Caruso with Nicolas Cage in Kiss of Death, New Jersey Drive, The Cure, uh, Mar uh, Leonardo DiCaprio in The Basketball Diaries, Burnt by the Sun, Kevin Spacey and Frank Whaley and Swimming with Sharks, and also Terry Zweigoff's Crumb. So, eight movies to look at next time around. we got a packed show next time. We'll look at those movies on the next episode. But until then, thank you very much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the plays on the next page. Check out the previous episode. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for another episode. So, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And until then, as always, take care.